Well, hello, free people of the Rocky Mountain region. Politics costs money. Most everybody knows that money is one of the most important factors in political campaigns, whether they're ballot initiatives or candidates running for office. But it's not always obvious where this money is coming from and, and who's spending it. Are these out-of-state interests pouring millions and maybe even more into Colorado to enforce their agenda to transform our state into a utopian vision that they believe? We'll find out here in this presentation. Natalie, thank you so much for joining me today. Happy to be here. Wonderful. If you don't know, Natalie Menton's a Liberty rock star from Lakewood here, and we're going to be going through some of the campaign spending from the most recent report. Uh, today we're recording this. It is September 21st. So we're going to look at some of the campaign finance spending on Proposition HH. So where is the money coming from? Let's expose some of the money behind Proposition HH. All right. You ready, Natalie? Yep. Cool. So perfect. So first one I want to do is just a slight recap. Um, you know, how did Proposition HH get on the ballot? It's one of the most important ballot initiatives this year that all Colorado voters are going to be facing. Just very quickly, the state legislature passed a Senate bill back uh, in May when the legislative session was still in session to put this ballot measure uh, to Colorado voters. Very deceptive title, as we'll see here. But just know that Colorado's Democratic legislators are responsible for putting Proposition HH on the ballot this year. Prime sponsors of Senate Bill 303 were Steve Fenberg, Chris Hansen, Chris DeGray Kennedy, and Mike Wiseman. So this is what voters are going to be seeing in their uh, ballots every uh, this coming November. This deceptive ballot title seems pretty obvious. You know, Proposition HH, reduce property taxes and retain state revenue. Seems like a good thing, at least that first part, right? Reduce property taxes. Unfortunately, there's some deception here because the only reason this is on the ballot is because of that after that and that retain state revenue. The only reason Proposition HH is on the ballot is to take your tax refund money away from you. Proposition HH is bad for Colorado renters, workers, and families because they're going to lose their tax refund over time if this passes. So this retained state revenue here you see is underlined. The key bullet point, allow the state to retain money that would otherwise be refunded to taxpayers under the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights Tabor through at least 2032. So that's where the rubber meets the road, folks. Proposition HH... Uh, didn't need to be on the ballot except for this one reason. These legislators are deceptive because they could have lowered our property taxes without a ballot initiative. And in fact, them pushing it off onto the voters is pretty shameful, actually. So let's go ahead and look at some of the money here. Let's some track some of this campaign finance money. If you don't know, Tracer is set up by the Colorado Secretary of State. Tracer.sos.colorado.gov is your resource to look how can candidates are spending money, political campaigns, where they're getting it from, and a whole host of information. So that's going to be our primary resource here to track this campaign finance money. So one of the big ones there is this property tax relief now. That is the issue committee that was set up by proponents of Proposition HH to provide a direct electioneering by spending campaign money to get this passed, getting the voters to accept this ridiculous proposal. Uh, this is how they do it. You know, if somebody wants to get something on the ballot and wants to lobby and actually have some electioneering capabilities, state law requires that you file an issue committee like this or a similar type of committee. Of course, they called it property tax relief now because it's of that's the message they're trying to portray to the voters. But on Tracer, you can see a lot of information, the mailing address, physical address, the mission statement, the purpose of it, and kind of, you know, what else we're going to see here with the money. So the registered agent I thought was interesting. That's Tracy Moore. So every one of these political groups has to have somebody, has to have a name associated with it. They have to have an individual who who puts their name on the piece of paper and submits it. As you can see, uh, there's some clues here to kind of help us dig into this investigation. PTRN compliance at bluesummitsolutions.com is the email provided. So, of course, it makes me think that Blue Summit Solutions is a business um, that's somehow profiting off of Proposition HH or is involved in this electioneering activity. Let's keep going here. So this committee registered agent is Tracy Moore, a political compliance and operations expert. This is her LinkedIn here, and she is the founder of Blue Summit Solutions. So no surprise there. I've been doing it for nearly five years now, making some money, uh, helping some Democratic organizations or Democratic uh, advocates get their ballot measures through, as we'll see. 
So just looking up Tracy Moore online, uh, looking up her Blue Summit consultants, Blue Summit on the Tracer's website, we can kind of see a little bit of a picture here of how she's involved in some other political campaigns across Colorado. So back from 2020 to 2022, her company has been getting money, thousands and thousands of dollars for Coloradans for Carla Esser, Citizens for Carrie Warren Gully, Mount Communities for New Leadership. Now, I'm not too familiar uh, with any of these groups. Have you heard of any of these, Natalie? Um, I'm not familiar with the groups, but I am familiar with Carrie Warren Gully because uh, she is a Arapahoe County Commissioner. And as you might recall, you and I talked about Arapahoe County Commissioners having a executive sessions about the Tabor issue they want to put forward. I think you and I did a video about that. She's a county commissioner down there. So um, one of the ones that the elected who want to get rid of our taxpayers' bill of rights down in Arapaho, and they're planning a ballot issue for next year. So that's the only one that I recognize out of that group. But it tends to tell you which way this person may stand. And when I've seen Blue Summit, just the fact that it's got the word blue in it made me wonder also. A great point. I didn't even catch that. And it, the nice thing with Tracer, some of the fun uh, we're having here with this is you can kind of use it as an investigation tool. So we found this this lady's name, this Tracy Moore, found out she's associated with this organization by looking her up on LinkedIn, found out this organization is also involved in these other political campaigns. So we're starting to see the net. We're starting to see the web of Democratic operatives, Democratic funders, and Democratic candidates all working together in this system, in this organization, a loosely based organization, maybe just, just you know, not necessarily – on paper, but uh, we can track it here through Tracer. So let's keep going here. Also typed in Tracy Moore's name as the resident agent, uh, registered agent on Tracer, and she did come up in her polis for Colorado as well. So it tells you a lot that for Jared Polis's reelection campaign, Tracy Moore was doing the paperwork. So this compliance company that she has is not only associated with taking away our Tabor refunds, but also was associated with getting Jared Polis reelected. Kind of paints a little bit more of the picture here. Moving on, I thought it'd be interesting to see a little bit more about Tracy Moore uh, herself. We looked at her company, the money that she's received, and then some of the money that she's received as a consultant from these different groups out here. So let Colorado vote, yes on yet, S campaign, Colorado commits to kids. These different organizations or groups that she has received money from over the years, since 2013 at least, according to Tracer, uh, to, to help get these, these measures passed and to stay in compliance with state law. Natalie, do you know anything about uh, any of these organizations? Um, remind me, do you know about Let Colorado Vote? Uh, 2016. That may have been the national popular vote. Oh, it may have been. I'd have to look. I apologize for not having that handy. No, but that's all right. But I can tell from the top ones there, obviously, those are education issues. And I'm trying to think back with the 2014. Um, I'd have to look back on a yes on S campaign. But going back to the, the previous slide, I did one. Yeah, I had searched out the where she was also the registered agent. Yeah. And seeing that poll is for Colorado. I think that was the most clear picture right there of the ties. And then skipping forward um, back to where you were. Sorry about that. Um, you know, the more you start to see some of these agents and consultants and you know, there are multiple of these contributions, but then ultimately there are also governments that are hiring political consultants and they will sometimes end up in the middle of those uh, requests for proposal benefiting off taxpayer dollars. So it's a circular web kind of, I think you just said it a little bit ago, a circular web. And I, I could think of a specific uh, lobbyist advocacy uh, campaign group. Matter of fact, they've been hired. <laughs> Here's irony for you. Or, not irony. It's it's actually totally un... Um, it's not surprising at all. There is, if you go, I don't know if you're going to go into expenditures at all, but there's a lobbyist group that's being paid out of this Prop HH campaign, who is one of the ones that I have done so much homework over the years on all the ways that they are basically getting, taking uh, taxpayer money, working against the taxpayers. 
And that's what they do. And it's a circular thing. So I don't know if you go into expenditures and I don't want to go into that right now and interrupt you, but um, I've just seen this happen so many years here. And so I'm really glad you threw together these slides and are illustrating this. So I'll let you keep going. Yeah, I think it's important for people out there who don't really see how this works. You know, it's some of the same people behind a lot of these initiatives or candidates. I mean, right off the bat, searching Tracy Moore's name and Tracer as the registered agent, you can see it's the same people, you know, the same consulting group or compliance group that helped get Jared Polis reelected as working on Proposition HH. I mean, that's really the behind the scenes look. And if you know anything about Jared Polis's policies, you know, he's not interested in reducing property taxes uh, on the level that maybe people think this HH would do. So I won't go into expenditures, unfortunately, Natalie, on this video, but I would like to do that in a future video as well. Okay. Well, I may end up saying something about the other one later anyway. Go ahead. Perfect. So let's take a look. Uh, go ahead. And, well, we're going to go back to that committee, this Proposition HH committee and their finances. So we see who's running it, uh, what kind of organization is there, who they're associated with, and let's see the money that they've received so far. So this is the most recent contribution report uh, that ended on the 13th. Uh, the paperwork was due on the 18th of, of September here, so just a few days ago. So starting at $0 earlier this year, of course, when they began, getting $810,000. Wow, that's some big money. $810,000 is being spent by these special interest groups, as we'll see, to get voters in Colorado to pass Proposition HH. That's some serious money. Now, they've already spent 262000 of it, which uh, I'd like to cover in another video, maybe when the next expense report comes out, uh, leaving them still with a five hundred and fifty thousand dollar war chest going into the last little bit of this election cycle in 2023 here we're so where's this money they're actually coming in a little bit lower than than i expected for considering the governor's wealth you know but anyway um also there's still a whole lot of time left because the last report won't even actually come in till after the election like in December, and it won't be surprising to see some major money. So I'll let you continue. So the, let's look at the campaign finance reports. We're going to go through the three that are out here. So the most recent one that came out here on the 18th, uh, this is all on Tracer, the Secretary of State's uh, legal re reporting requirements here. So we see Bell Action Network giving $15,000 to for the Proposition HH Committee. James Kelly, uh, which I'm going to look at, uh, name I wasn't familiar with, but seems pretty involved with v v Vestar Capital Partners, $25,000, and Phil Long Dealerships down in Colorado Springs, another $25,000. It's very disappointing to see Phil Long dealerships. I wasn't uh, familiar with the political activism of Phil Long, and very unfortunate to see that. Uh, my mom bought her first car back in the late 1970s, a Mustang uh, from Phil Long Ford down there, so I'm sure she'll be disappointed to see this. Yeah, um, I think they, I, without saying this, I think they may have like done a couple other little things like this, but I was a little bit surprised too. And with Bell Action Network, um, that one's, you know, not, not surprising. Uh, Bell, when you've been asking, who am I familiar with? Um, I had to do a little bit of research on this James Kelly to look at it. And you're right, he is been a deep pocket source on a long list of issues for what I was seeing with that one. And Bell Action Network, uh, they have really one goal in life, and that is to get rid of the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights and to reduce, or I'm sorry, increase taxes on those who make over a certain amount of income. And some people call it a progressive income tax. I don't call it that. The best term I've come up with is um, a punitive income tax because it is penalizing, um, punishing people who make over a certain income, uh, which is the drive really of part of the component of HH with the refund flattening um, that people I mean, it's, it's based upon a scale, which you pay in currently, which you pay in, you get a, a rebate, technically a ref, you know, it's a refund, um, in comparison to what you put in. And 
people like or the group Scott like Scott Wasserman who runs Bell Action Network. Uh, he is totally driven in variety of ways to penalize people above that certain income level. And that's a really just, well, it, it's, it's not a good thought process. And you're penalizing somebody for their productivity. And that's just not a good idea in society, frankly. And rewarding those who um, are putting in less by taking, I mean, that's it's really uh, robbing one to give to another, really, is what that boils down to. So their action, they've got a luxury tax they were proposing. If you owned a property over $2 million, I remember I was down at the title board uh, in the room with this one because uh, they had a slew of bad ones. I mean, bad ideas, bad ideas. So that's the indication there of how HH should be treated. But um, a luxury tax on properties above $2 million. And a matter of fact, I got to say, if you remember the pre one of the previous videos, I actually used the guy that runs Bell as his property as the example, just to throw it in, you know what? And it, and his property is a million dollars. So I wonder if he had a tough time picking, you know, what luxury tax level should it be? I mean, well, certainly couldn't be $800,000 because his own house would have been above that level. So he picked $2 million uh, with an inflation rate so that, that anyway... A um, little more familiarity with Bell Action Network than probably the average person and all of the policy decisions that I've seen out of Bell Action Network um, do not follow what I think is a good way to treat taxpayers. Um, so I'll let you keep going there. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. I think uh, people, if you ever see Bell Action Network involved, uh, warning bells should ring. These people are authoritarians who hate the idea that taxpayers can keep their money and make decisions about tax and spend policy in their local community. So thanks for sharing that, Natalie. I always love hearing your stories and all the expertise you've gained over the years uh, looking into and, these programs. Yeah, and another thing here to give you an idea how deep – when they put up a Prop HH at the last minute in the last roughly week of the legislative session. And I mean, I dropped like work and everything to get down there to the hearing on, oh, it was when they were presenting the flattening bill. And it was a Saturday afternoon. I mean, I hustled down there. I was there like 25 minutes to dropped everything. I was in the backyard work and dropped down to go down to the Capitol. And I, I run in because who else would be listening to their headset, you know, for a legislative hearing on a Saturday afternoon, right? And with with like Sunday, Monday, and what, and Tuesday? Was it Monday night that ended? I can't believe I forget that. But anyway, as I go into that room, Scott Wasserman, head of Bell Policy Network, is sitting in that room. So he had the total heads up, you know, advance notice of this this these terrible set of bills. And they get the inside scoop. Uh, that's the part of that true, as I say, their network. Sorry, you had to reminded me of being upset that day when I went down to the state capitol because I was pretty mad about all of that. And then I oh, sat down. I sat down with Chris Kennedy, DeGroy Kennedy. They're in that room and told him how um, miserable Prop HH title was. And if he believes in transparency, that ballot title that's included with Prop HH is it's it was horrible. And he says, well, is there anything like legally wrong? And this is a guy that sponsored other transparency bills. So when it you know, fits for their agenda, it's OK. But in something like Proposition HH, which is a totally deceptive bill, because it doesn't mention about giving up consent. It doesn't mention about local governments. I mean, over I'm over at their website right now. And I'm sorry if I'm going to rant about this a little bit. You know, on their own little thing here, it says when a local government wants to opt out, it says the government has to uh, send notice to property owners. This is this group, by the way, right? The Property Tax Relief Now. Their website says if, if revenues are projected to exceed the cap, the local government must reduce its property tax rate, mill levy. If the governing body of the district wants to retain revenue over the cap, it must send a notice to property owners, convene a meeting with public testimony, and vote to retain any amount of revenue over the cap. That's baloney. That's wrong. They don't have to send a notice to um, property owners. I mean, these folks are running a campaign where they're telling outright fabrications 
on their website, which I'm not going to say because, you know, you don't give like any kind of uh, people can look it up. I'm sure they'll get some money, some ads hit from there. But that's a total um, fabrication. Local governments, all they have to do is publish notice in a major newspaper within the county. You look at the average amount of people that read the section where a public notice would be printed, all right? First, it's not the sports page, okay? Let me give you that, all right? It's not on the front page of the newspaper, okay? I'll give you, it's buried within that newspaper down in some section where somebody's changing their last name and there's like 1,400 words describing the person changing their last name. That's where this government notice is buried and that's all they got to do to post it. And then they're going to take public testimony and you've got that elected body who's going to wave the cap. So anyway, um, I wouldn't have thought that rant for some reason, but just telling people it's like a bad thing. So yeah, no, it's it's a, the you modest know. operandi of, of these people, you know, to present a deceptive uh, title, a deceptive oh, information to the said voters. Was, it was Kennedy, sorry. Yeah. So, you know, they're running this bill and they push it through. I mean, it's re why the Republicans walked off the floor. I was down there actually that night from the balcony watching what was going on, um, partly because there was another bill too. It's um, the land use bill. But watching this and, you know, to have testimony shut down over HH and I was there to watch it. Last minute bill. I mean, I go down to test. Okay, I'm going to rant again. Um, sorry, but when I went down on that that day, uh, on a Saturday afternoon, dropping everything in my backyard, I get down because they'd introduced that flattening bill. So within three hours, basically, from the floor where it was a mystery bill, uh, 1311, that's a 23-1311, um, to getting down there to testify, it was pushed first on the agenda. I get up there to testify. And some newspaper reporter, uh, Marianne Goodlin was there, and she reported on this. I'm like, I testify and said, there's not even the agenda, this bill posted on the internet. And I said, I'd love to testify about this, but it hasn't even been posted for public notice. So anyway, no, I'm sorry, you can keep going now. No, it's great. I really appreciate you sharing that. And and yeah, I mean, it just, it just does, goes to show how deceptive this whole process has been to get HH on the ballot. So let's see. This was the, so we just looked at the three big the three donors. This is all that was listed: Bell Action Network, James Kelly, and Phil Long Dealerships on the September eighteenth contributions report. Let's go ahead and look at the previous report from nine five. I'll uh, going through these quickly. We have Gerald Glick, a real estate professional, so a developer, a National Education Association, which we will get into. Uh, people probably know who they are. Washington D.C. based organization, one hundred thousand dollars. Gary Advocacy. Uh, from Denver here, a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. Harry Frampton, another big developer, uh, a famous ski industry guy. We'll take a quick look at him uh, for $10,000. And then the Zeppelins, Andra and Ke Kyle, also developers, uh, pushing this initiative with a modest $5,000 each. So that was the September 5th report for financing. Any uh, co comments on these these names, Gary, Natalie? Gary Advocacy is the big funder behind Proposition 123 from last year and other um, money schemes, tax schemes that would take money from one to give to another. So perfect. And NEA, uh, no surprise, especially with the, the real mission of HH and where these uh, forfeited Tabor refunds go. So that's a uh, September 5th finance report. A uh, previous one was from August 1st, uh, that finance report there. And I do apologize. It looks like the slide got a little cut off here, but I think we'll get the idea. Colorado Education Association, 50,000. Uh, that's the Colorado Teachers Union, of course, CEA, 1630 fund, 60,000. Pat Stryker, uh, 100,000. Education Reform Now Advocacy, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. I hadn't, I wasn't too familiar with them, $100,000. And then boldly forward, which is another polis group, uh, fifty thousand dollars there. Any comments on these quickly? Nice deep pockets, aren't they? Yeah. Yep. And big money. Where, and where's the local? Because what you're showing here, Brandon, isn't just a filtered list of who has contributed to this campaign. 
that's really the chunk. It's special. Well, I think you're going to go into that, but it's notable because I'm actually the registered agent for our um, Tabor Coalition Issue Committee, and which is the rejecthh.com website. And I can say our donors don't at all look like this. Ours are retired people. People are concerned about their property taxes. Um, they're the regular neighbors people have, not these, you know, just groups that out of Washington, D.C., um, heavy-duty activists, and again, Polis has fingerprints over a lot of this, a lot of this. Yeah, and I mean, here we see Washington, D.C. for 1630, New York for Education Reform Now advocacy. So it's a lot of out-of-state money. It's this, this East Coast establishment money, these Democratic organizations sending their money through. So let's take a, a little bit uh, deeper dive in some of the big spenders. So that one there is something I hadn't really heard of, Education Reform Now Advocacy, Inc., the $100,000 that they've uh, pitched in so far. So they this is from their website, Education Reform Now. They say they are a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank and advocacy organization promoting increased resources and reforms in public schools. So uh, pretty interesting. Uh, one of the key lines, they have a chapter here in Colorado, which I'm just going to mention for, in the next couple of slides. One of the big things that they take credit for is the universal preschool program. Um, one of Polis's programs there, this group is, is claiming responsibility for getting that passed. And then I highlighted something off their website, something, uh, an issue that Natalie and I have been talking about for a while now, issue near and dear to our hearts. They say ensuring, this is what these guys do. This is $100,000 they're spending. They want to ensure mill levy equity so that all public schools are given equitable access to resources, regardless of the governance model that they function under. So they want to take that mill levy money and distribute it how they think, um, how they think it's, they see fit. You know, not leaving it up to those local communities to decide. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I, think, I think they'll also be tied into the other measure we're seeing, Prop I. I. So anyway, go ahead. Education reform now out of New York, uh, a 501c3, so a total nonprofit tax deductible organization. Uh, that's the parent company. As you can see, they have some pretty big money. This was the most uh, recent campaign data on, or not campaign, excuse me, uh, money information on ProPublica.org. So in 2021, bringing in uh, nine, over almost nearly $10 million. Pretty incredible there, having thirteen million dollars in assets and bringing in ten million dollars a year as a as a educational think tank. I mean, they got a lot of money to play with across the country. So this New York based group is playing in Colorado politics. Not only that, but they do have a Colorado chapter. So their Colorado chapter is the Democrats for Education Reform in Colorado. They've had it. This guy here, Will Andrus, has been the uh, political director since twenty fourteen. Now, you can read a little bit about him and his team here. But of course, before working for DFER, this guy, Will Andrus, had worked on winning Democratic Congressional Senate legislative political campaigns, Colorado, Wisconsin, and Missouri. So he's here uh, helping with the Denver Public School Board races, uh, endorsing, trying to decide who they want to serve on those seats and uh, provide campaign support to candidates for the Colorado Legislature and State Board of Education. So this is uh, the part of the web, part of this network of out-of-state money and influence that's coming into Colorado to control our local education system. And now, of course, they're pushing to support Proposition HH. So Will Andrus, I saw this, it kind of made me curious. So I t put his name into Tracer. Of course, he came up with his Democrats for Education Reform Colorado Political Committee out of Denver there, and there can be another topic to talk about another time. They've been around since 2012 to influence the nomination and election of individuals who promote the goals and objectives of Democrats for Education Reform Colorado. And of course, Rachel Gordon, a name I've seen many times over the years as a registered agent for a lot of other Democratic um, ballot measures as well. So all connected to the same network. I thought this was interesting. Yeah. Anything on uh, Democrats for Education Reform Colorado, Natalie? No, no. All right, let's move on to the other big spender here. Of course, uh, most people probably know who this is, Pat Stryker. If you're involved in Fort Collins up there, she uh, has her hands on a lot of different things up there. 
this article I thought was interesting from the Fort Collins Colorado from April 6, 2023. Uh, her estimated net worth is $3.2 billion. So 905 on the list of the world's uh, billionaires. So she's in the top half there. Uh, <laughs> one of the richest people out there. And of course, uh, here's an article from freestatecolorado.com that I wrote earlier this year about New Era Colorado, one of the groups that fundamentally transformed our political scene by getting Democratic majority elected. Uh, they had something called Colorado Democracy Alliance in 2004, where Jared Polis, Pat Stryker, Tim Gill, and Rupp Bridges funded at least 37 political left organizations in Colorado, including this new era, uh, in order to shift the political scene. So, of course, Pat Stryker has been around for a while, been involved in a lot of political scenes. But just knowing that she supports this bill should obviously be a red flag for anybody who who wants to keep a, a hold of their pocketbook. Yeah, that's why I've. Like pockets like that, um, I've been put out to friends and some activist people willing to take a bet on how much they'll end up spending, and I'd said over five million, uh, because there's some deep pockets here that can gang in from the gang of four. All right, let's uh, take a look here. Uh, Pat Stryker also contributed two point. Two and a quarter million dollars for Amendment B in 2020. Of course, uh, you may know that Amendment B was with the quote unquote repeal of the Gallagher Amendment. Uh, 57% passed there, but she contributed $2.2 million for it. So when you really think about it, you know, Proposition HH, of course, is on the ballot. It's kind of be that whole connection back to Amendment B, the repeal of Gallagher leading to this higher residential property rates. And now we're seeing Proposition HH attempt to address some of that, but it's the same people who are behind it all. So they're taking, they create the crisis, right? Pat yep. Stryker and her people, they create this crisis of property tax, record property taxes in Colorado two years ago, or now, you know, three years ago, and then come in here now, three years later with their solution and they're funding it both ways. So of course uh, it's their agenda, it's their state and their mind, and they want to control our political scene and determine how people are paying property taxes to reshape society in their image. Yes. And just to, to chime in there, the reminder that the legislature knew about the property tax issue well before January of 2023 and it was in the state of the state address about how they're going to take care of the problem. And they waited till the last week. There's only one reason HH is on the ballot, and it's because it asked to keep our refunds. They could call an emergency session if they wanted, which we've talked about before, and they could take care of this rate. There's also the local property tax reduction, mill levy reduction we've talked about. So that the deception, the 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 big plan. And it feels, you know, like want to just kind of, I don't know, get get quite upset about how the chess moves are being used and what they have further up their sleeve. So why even give them a bit for those who may be on the fence about something and say, like I've heard, you know, well, if, if I'm only going to stay in but this amount of time in the property, da, 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 maybe it would be to have benefit to just take the money and run because I know in the long run, it's a big it's a big sham, but if I just benefit off a little bit, but even giving them an inch on anything, um, they're not to be trusted as seen by their own website, which, which has false lies on it. Anyway, go ahead. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next big spender here, the National Education Association with a $100,000 contribution here so far. Uh, we'll keep an eye to see if they do more. Just for people who aren't familiar with the NEA, the National Education Association, I, I did a quick search, found this article from earlier this year. Just thought it would be uh, interesting, of course, because this is all in the news about quote unquote banned books and school boards. I mean, it's one of the hottest political battles, of course, in Colorado nationwide about what, what it's in school libraries, what are parents parents having kids read. So the NEA, just to give you an idea of some of their agenda, uh, this was their uh, reading list for teachers, for educators in the summer. And uh, they wanted to, uh, they were encouraging all the teachers to read for, write, <laughs> White Fragility, 
you know, to, and of course this, uh, other book, uh, called gender queer, which, uh, apparently has some very racy content in it that local libraries, even today, um, I think it's happening now in Douglas County and some other places. It's, it's an ongoing issue. So just to know that NEA, uh, is putting big money here and they're involved in a lot of these political fights. The National Education Association of the United States from ProPublica, of course, a Washington, D.C. group, tax exempt since 1970, 501c5. Uh, just look at this most recent data. Their revenue in 2021, nearly $400 million. I mean, it is buku bucks, $400 million. That's why they are so politically powerful. And why they can spend, you know, hundred thousand dollars so far, probably more, as we may predict, to uh, influence our local elections here in Colorado, so that they can shift how property taxes are being spent or being collected. Now, see if you could tell me this: what is the? Um, oh, it's a C five status, and because of the labor organization, okay. Yep, deep All pockets. Right. And that's that's a dues, which teachers, I, as far as I know, should still be reminded. I think it's the time period coming up here pretty quick that teachers can opt out of the political dues still here, but there's a window to do it. Um, I know Independence Institute is a great resource if somebody's interested in double checking that, as I don't know it off the top of my head, but go ahead. So looking at uh, Gary Advocacy oh, yeah. uh, and Gary yeah. Community, one of the big spenders here. So, of course, they not only supported Amendment B, along with Pat Stryker in 2020, contributing 700 and, uh, excuse me, contributing $1.2 million on Amendment B in 2020. That's that bottom uh, graphic there with a text. And then supporting Proposition 123 in 2022, where Gary Advocacy contributed $750,000, Gary Ventures incorporated two million dollars so it's interesting to see these same players these same people involved of course the current mayor denver mike johnston was headed up heading up gary community investments back then in 2020 uh to to, to totally take away the gallagher amendment and try and raise property taxes on coloradans mm -hmm. any thoughts on these people natalie i got i debated mike johnston over Prop 123. Nice enough fellow, but we have a difference of opinion on government roles. So, yeah, no, just the same thing. I mean, yeah, it was head of Prop 123. Now he's the governor um, advocating. Uh, you know, how the Walmarts got in there, I don't, I never have, I think, knew about that before, and I didn't quite understand that one. But, no, you need to continue. This is just powerful, powerful people who have a lot, lot of money. And they just, it'd be fine if they were putting in their own money, right? Like if they believe in this charity, go spend the six dot figure, to, you know, amount, the whatever amount. But, but don't spend money to take part of my money. I mean, that's not charitable is it no no they totally want to steal our hard-earned money especially how shameful that is now when everything's even more expensive to continue to want to take our tax refunds away from us so i wanted to take a look at some of these other spenders uh particularly because i hadn't heard of them before so i thought it'd be interesting so james kelly a vester capital partners has contributed twenty five thousand dollars so far uh, found this article, don't agree necessarily with the entire premise of the article, but nonetheless, was pretty interesting. Uh, big uh, controversy in Colorado this year is these health plan groups, these uh, health insurance companies being forced out of the state, either collapsing or being shut down by state regulators. So just to read a couple highlights from this article here to see the connection with James Kelly. So James Kelly, Vester Capital Partners is this private equity group. And they backed this health insurer Friday health plans. So they're the ones who kind of gave them the money back uh, oh, a few years ago. 
to keep them going, to get them started. Uh, and, and it failed. I mean, they've lost 30,000 people lost health insurance on August 31st of this year when Friday health plan, plans collapsed. So of course that was uh, bad news for a lot of people there. And I'll just read this here. Friday had been operating plans in Colorado for six years and for less than three years in six other states where it operated. So Friday is based in Denver, received backing from Vester Capital Partners, a private equity firm with strong Colorado connections. This star managing director, Jim Kelly, is based in Denver and also heads the Colorado Impact Fund, where former Denver mayor and U.S. Transportation and Energy Secretary Federico Pena is senior advisor. From 2006 to 2018, Vestar owned the Mentor Network, a for-profit foster care company for children with intellectual and physical disabilities. A bipartisan report from the Senate Finance Committee found that 94 children died in the company's care during that period. So I thought this was interesting just because there's this connection uh, to see James Kelly, somebody who's now supporting Proposition HH, his private equity company involved in supporting this uh, health insurance company that ended up failing and leaving people out. But it's interesting to see, you know, obviously James Kelly, his group getting involved with these government schemes uh, for this local health insurance program that didn't work and kind of a sign, I think, of his failures on, on that front and the possible failures of hopefully the failure of Proposition HH as well. But I thought this was interesting, just something that kind of tied into the news. Uh, so, yeah, any thoughts on this, Natalie? Um, did you look into the Colorado Impact Fund? A little bit, yeah. There's uh, some articles out there about it. Um, they definitely have a lot of money and want to do some you know, social welfare work um, based in charity, uh, kind of partnering with the government. So, of course, it's these public-private partnerships that are, are bound to fail, you know, kind of almost socialism light in a way and the centrally managing of our society and just a perfect example of the failures of this government, you know, not entirely government run, but of course, uh, government controlled health plan system. And uh, it's interesting to see these guys in the middle of it. Well, I'd be interested in checking out a few of these names through the uh, Colorado Transparency Online Project system. Oh, perfect. Uh, just looking real here real quick. Here's uh, Jim Kelly here. Uh, so, you know, managing director, founding partner of the firm. What I thought was interested, I highlighted at the top. Uh, they have this little drop down menu on the VSTAR website here. Uh, ESG and DEI for anybody who's been, you know, kind of paying attention to some of this local corporate control over uh, society and the attempts by these big, uh, big companies, big uh, private equity firms to try and control society and shift culture in a certain way. It's through these ESG, environmental, social, and governments programs and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I thought that was an interesting little red flag. I know a lot of people watching this will see those uh, ESG and DEIs and know that you know Jim Kelly's uh, group here is uh, heavily involved with those kinds of ideas and projects to really you know manage where money's going in society to shift the culture to a more equitable and more uh, just society, I guess, if you will, in their vision. So kind of interesting. And of course, it makes sense when you put this all together. Yeah, and that's what came to mind that there's down at the very bottom, the Pitt and Foundation. So more more of the same players. So go ahead. Nature Conservancy, Argentina, Pitt and Foundation. Yeah, it's a whole network out there. Well, I another know spend the first one, but I know about the Pitt Foundation. Okay, uh, another uh, spender out there with a fifteen thousand dollars was Jerry Glick, Urban Ventures LLC. There was this Westward article. Uh, Westward article was pretty interesting. If you know anything about Westward, they're pretty progressive or left leaning uh, news organization out there. So the title of this article was, you know, a developer can be a dirty word in Denver, meet five exceptions to the rule. So Westward is, uh, you know, coming out in, in support of this Jerry Glick guy saying that he's a developer who's, you know, maybe socially conscious, who's who's pushing uh, an agenda that the, the, the leftists at Westward agree with. So I thought that was pretty interesting here. So Jerry Glick, his company is Urban Ventures, LLC. And uh, they focus on redeveloping urban properties into communities that make a positive contribution to their neighborhoods. So whether it's new construction or an adaptive reuse of an old building, uh, Powers, Susan P Powers and his and her partner, Jerry Glick, look for projects in areas that most developers had overlooked. So very interesting to see how these big developers are supporting Proposition HH. I uh, thought that was kind of interesting. 
Also, Jerry Glick as well was nominated by Jared Polis, our governor here, to uh, be on the MSU, so Metro State University, Denver, uh, be a trustee for MSU. So big real estate developer, of course, connected a, a Polis a, a nominee for this appointment to this trustee position to be on this governing board. Of course, voted then by the Senate Education Committee, which I'm sure is some of the same players who are getting Proposition HH on the ballot. So just a total circular network here. Another spender here, uh, Kyle and Andra Zeppelin. Another Westward article, very interesting. Interesting to see uh, Westward kind of, you know, being the PR for PR organization here in defense of some of these developers. So that's uh, interesting, uh, kind of a, a note there I, I caught. But so article here, Kyle Zeppelin wants to build a city of the future. Is it all a pipe dream? So this is an article from 2019 where he can, Kyle Zeppelin considers himself the better angel of his trade, a moralistic rebel of real estate. Standing shoulder to shoulder with community activists, bemoaning the thoughtless architecture that's transforming Denver. So, so, I mean, take what you want from that sentence there. Kind of a convoluted way to say that, you know, he's part of this, this socially conscious group of developers who are all coming together to raise our, uh, to quote unquote, lower property taxes, but take away our tax refund, redistribute that money to their own schemes, apparently, and uh, reimagine society in their own way. What is a moralistic rebel of real estate? <laughs> that is a great question. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I, know. Make, I want to stare at that for like <laughs> three minutes going, what does that mean? <laughs> anyway, go ahead. It, it means he probably donates to democratic <laughs> organizations and he's in, of course, as we've seen in his, uh, he said, you got to see at the table, you know, that's what it seems with some of these people, right? They get involved, they play the game and now they're connected, you know, it's kind of putting in your dues to get a seat at the table with these big wigs, like the, like the Polis crowd. That's my thought, at least, you know, my opinion there. Another spender like a here. A lot of light, a lot of black tie events. So oh, I'm sure. Some of these names and they'll come up and it'll be, you know, like old days where people go around the room and there's a photographer and the photographer will take your little canned photo and go, and I was at the black tie, you know, and they're, meanwhile, they're talking about city deals here at the table, you know, over mm -hmm. champagne and shrimp cocktail. Yep. Anyway, yep. Go ahead. Where's this taxpayer money going to go? That's uh, I'm, I'm sure people are lining up. <laughs> No, I know, but you know, it's hard. It's not, it's easy to think of cigar smoke filled back rooms and black tie events, you know, with thousand dollar plate dinners and things like that, where these people are, are getting involved meeting each other and getting, getting together. It's, it's very easy to think that whether it's true or not. Well, and I got to say, actually, you know, on the RTD board, uh, when I was on there, we got an expense account to go to these dinners and we would get invitation an invitation, an invitation, and they all had ticket prices to them. So it'd be like the cheap ones would be 80 or a hundred dollars. Some of them were like $200 and there were RTD directors that would take advantage. We had a certain amount you could go to. All right. Cause you like had a capped expense and they would go to one, one after another, just to max, max it out. That was public dollars. So you know, actually, it's not a now that I think back, not a far fetched thing. I refuse to go to these things. I mean, <laughs> me, I'm not going to go to it. Besides the fact that, like, I would want to dress up and schmooze with a bunch of political insiders anyway who want to rip off taxpayers. I mean, does that sound like a good evening anyway? <laughs> you know? So, and then on top of it, you're going to think I'm going to spend. As a penny pincher, elected official, I'm going to spend hundred or hundred fifty dollars or whatever on a, you know, five course meal to do whatever. They had chamber events and all over. I mean, you really wouldn't believe it. It was, uh, you know, I'm thinking back to that. I hadn't even thought about that for a while. Anyway, I interrupted. We we're talking about no. dinner schmoozing and how it happens. Well, it happens on your your taxpayer dollar sometimes. No, that's very interesting and uh, very important, I think. And I appreciate the the comment there because, yeah, this is it's a network. You know, it's this insider group of people who are trying to who are spending big money to to reshape our society. You know, and it, they do deserve some exposure and some criticism, I think. Yeah. So another name on there was Harry Frampton, who's uh, contributed ten thousand dollars towards Proposition HH committee so far. Uh, he developed the Colorado's mountain towns. So up there, you know, some of these massive resorts up in the mountains, developed the mountain towns. And from this Colorado Sun article, he uh, 
sees a bright future ahead for places that are, quote, a retreat from the crazy changing world and has, quote, some controversial ideas for solving the high country's housing crisis. So very interesting to see the developers who are all contributing money to Proposition HH. It seems to be a common theme that they have either controversial ideas or a vision of how they want society to be managed. They're willing to spend the money to make it happen. So pretty interesting. Uh, For anybody curious, if you don't want to read the article, Harry Frampton thinks the government should get involved and basically just buy huge plots of land and uh, build government housing, basically massive hotels or apartment buildings at the taxpayer expense in order to, to get housing for, you know, to pay the resorts, to get the resorts employees housed. He wants taxpayers to pay for it. So, of course, uh, some controversial idea there from this guy. And so you think about it. What have we seen here on developers? We've had, you've had, what, like three or four examples. So let's look. Tabor was just nicked in the side last November uh, 2022 with Proposition 123, which now takes um, a certain percentage of revenue from taxpayers' pockets, and instead of putting it in a general fund, it goes into a special um, um, government-managed, taxpayer-funded housing scheme. And part of that goes to developers, who as part of the deal in Prop 123, you know, if they complete the deal and increase subsidized housing by X amount, uh, it's part of the deal. But if they default and don't do what they're supposed to do, they don't actually have to pay it back. And you've got now government as a competitor taking money that was originally going into our pocket uh, to probably help us cover like housing costs and now taking it out of our pocket to give it to somebody else. And you get developers in it. So yeah, this is how it all frames up, right? Nice and pretty. Yep, yep. You can see the interest groups involved the network of people and kind of have this behind the scenes of how who who's who are these people you know who are these people with just big big pockets big checkbooks coming in and uh, trying to change our political scene and take away our our tax refund money away from working class coloradans people who are just struggling to get by and these multimillionaires or billionaires want to come in and, and just take it away from us you know there was a um and a measure passed I'm, I'm gonna throw this in we can talk about it maybe some other day a measure many years ago it was called the um uh, pre- uh, stop pay to play. And basically it was to prevent campaign contributions that would go um, like fast tracks, people that, you know, can, or companies that contributed to fast tracks. If then they got a contract, there were all these rules, restrictions, even some um, where it was prevented and they got overturned by the courts. And, but you still see this stuff. You do see it in action and it's not just, um, you know, speculation it is, as you've showed, you know, indicated, you can find these things on Tracer eventually. And then if there's enough transparency on the government end as to where the spending is, who has the contracts, which is a whole nother uh, video blog in itself, um, to have those contracts up, to be able to see those webs. Um, that one lobbyist I was talking about is called CRL Associates. I mean, they have their hands dipped in all over all sorts of governments. And they've just been hired by this problem. HH campaign. And the reason is, well, okay, I'm going to go on this because this guy there has such good communi- uh, roles with the local governments, right? Because he gets all these contracts. They get they get their contracts from them. That what they're trying to do is reverse, reverse the damage from Special Districts Association and Colorado Municipal League coming out in opposition to HH. So they're going to pay this lobbyist or consultant, or whatever you want to call it, law consultant, to go around and try to sweet talk local governments into reversing their position and their hesitation about HH. Um, and, you know, it goes back to, well, if you do it, if you come out and if you'll help, you know, us get HH across the finish line, we'll help you do this. So, you know, it's all favoritism anyway. All right, keep wow. going. No, I'd love to talk more about that, Natalie, in the future. I think that is a an, a ripe idea to to really get in front of people is this corruption and the schemes to uh, to have this pay for play type of system. But I just wanted to share this uh, earlier article that came out earlier this year. I actually did not use it as a reference really at all. Uh, so other information, I didn't go into the detail in this article for people who want to get some more information, want to dig a little deeper. There's a Colorado politics article that came out back in, in August originally going through uh, some of this spending. So the initial campaign filings. 
So really, you know, I guess I'd say there's more in the future. Uh, if, if anything of interest pops up, I'd love to do another video and and see if we can do a little bit more of a deep dive and really get a better picture of some of these players in Colorado's political scene that people may be unaware of. So the next filings are due here on October 3rd, October 16th, the 30th, and then December 12th, as you stated earlier, that'll be the final one to show us uh, where that little last home stretch of spending was. So still more filing, more information to come out, but uh, just massive pocketbook so far, uh, massive amounts of money, $800,000 being contributed so far by some very wealthy organizations and individuals uh, to push HH. So, you know, this is kind of hopefully useful to people so you can really start to dig in and maybe do some research yourself if you're interested to get on Tracer. Uh, it's pretty easy to do to, to dig in, see who these people are, who's spending money and get a better picture of how this game is being played. Perfect. Well, Natalie, anything to any final thoughts on this video? Uh, just from since we're talking campaign finance and I've looked at the expenditures, their big messaging point is got to vote for HH because uh, it will prevent this 40 percent property tax increase. But what they don't tell you is that uh, there's only a little piece of that that's a lowering of the assessment. It's a little bit minuscule piece of savings. And the other part of this so-called property relief can be waived. Uh, that's an exchange for the Tabor refunds being nicked away to nothing, zero. And renters take us especially the huge hit because they're not even getting the minuscule property tax relief in a direct manner. So um, I th I'm sure you'll want to be back because the, the checks are going to start to grow. This, you know, as I've heard, um, government officials say, really, this is not about property tax relief. This is about eliminating the taxpayer's bill of rights. And with the Democrats, number one, go to anybody can go to their uh, Colorado political platform and go under the financial goals, and they'll see number one is repeal Tabor. So HH is what that's about. Um, they just didn't want to explain have that exposed. Unfortunately, a lot of media is caught on, but it comes down to with their messaging, what is most important is to get the 66% of the population to understand that they cannot believe the ballot question because it's deceptive and that takes word of mouth. So I think we can kill it and I'll leave it at that. We'll really appreciate that, Natalie. Uh, Proposition HH is a bad idea. And uh, get this word out there. And we'll see you next time. This is BrandonFreeStateColorado.com. And appreciate you joining us today. Take care.